Okay. We'll click start. Great. Hi, everyone. We'll just give another minute or so for everyone to start streaming into the webinar. We'll go ahead and get started. Just give us one minute. All right. Looks like it's slowing down. Looks like everybody's in. Um, so good afternoon and, and welcome to the latest installment of the HGSA Research Webinar Series. I'm, I'm George Yorling and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Leora Fox, who Hi there. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be presenting the, uh, a year in review. And if those of you dialing in and you're seeing this title, um, the 2020, the best year ever, you're probably thinking to yourself, what the hell is wrong with this guy? Um, uh, but I want to talk about what Lior and I want to talk about is, is give you some things to think about. Uh, 2020 may have been the best year ever for HD drug development. Um, but before we do that, some of you uh, may be new to this Zoom format. Um, you can go into your uh, chat icon, which is shown uh, here. And at any time during our presentation, just type a question into Lior or me. And at the end, we'll make sure we have time dedicated to answer those questions. We're also recording this, so if you have to, if you get dropped, um, or you have to, you have to uh, take off, or you have know someone who might benefit from hearing this, um, we'll make sure this is available um, on our YouTube channel or, at, or on hgsa.org, usually within a week or so uh, of the airing of this. Uh, just a quick shout out to next month's webinar will be uh, March 9th uh, from 12 to 1 Eastern time, where we'll be um, hearing from Dr. Aaron Furstimming from University of Texas in Houston and Daniel Clausen, who's at Vanderbilt University, who are the PIs for a, a current phase three study called Connect HD. So we'll be hearing the details on that from uh, Dr. Furstimming and Dr. Clausen. Um, and so Let's get started. So 2020, best year ever, let's think about it. Um, I think if you ask everyone socially and politically and just health wise, um, you know, to give it a Yelp rating, uh, pretty much it'd probably be unanimous that we'd say hmm, zero to one stars, very bad, would not recommend 2020 to anybody. Let's move on to, uh, to 2021. Um, but you know, that's really kind of all in your perspective. And as I th thought about the year, as we we're putting this together, I was thinking, you know, was 2020 really that bad? Um, and it made me re remember just how old I am and, and that I've been working in this field on and off since for over 20 years. And when I joined the HD research community in 2000, I thought about what we were working on as a field and the number of companies that were working in this space. And they're really, uh, really weren't any companies. And if there were any companies, those companies no longer exist. And these are a number of the different drugs or, or compounds that were, we were talking about as researchers putting into humans for, for therapies for HD. Um, these were really low hanging fruits um, and really not necessarily based in the reality of the biology of Huntington's disease, which we know is caused by this expanded Huntington gene. Um, so many of those drugs went into the clinic. Many of you may have been in these studies or have loved ones who are in these studies. And, and these are just some of the headlines. And, and unfortunately, it was basically failure upon failure um, of showing that a number of these different drugs just did not meet the clinical endpoints uh, set out in the clinical trials. So, you know, that's what we were doing 20 years ago. Um, and as I look, look as to what we're doing now, um, luckily we're, we've learned from that and, and we've had technology advancements. We're not doing the same thing over and over. And that would be uh, as, as our local, I'm in Princeton, New Jersey and our local resident, famous resident uh, Albert Einstein would say it's insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So we definitely needed a new approach to target identification and validation of, of finding new targets and new drugs for Huntington's disease. And um, Whereas 20 years ago, we were chasing down things that bound to the Huntington protein or, 
or may be potentially downstream in different pathways related to Huntington's disease that we didn't know if they were necessarily uh, causative or merely a consequence of the disease. Um, we we're also only able to target proteins that were quote unquote druggable, things that you could develop a small molecule like an aspirin, you know, to, to, to a target. Um, but now we are, you know, to fast forward 20 years, we're, we're have a much more human centric approach to drug discovery. Uh, this is really spearheaded from some of the GWAS, the genome wide association studies that I think Leora will, will briefly mention and touch upon and how this is really advanced science uh, in the HD field. We're focused on the natural history of the disease through things like enroll HD and track and predict. We're really focused on the full length Huntington protein as opposed to small fragments, that that's all we could work on years ago. Um, and just genomic technology improvements in the cost that, that things have been driven down, you know, just 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago, it used to cost, it cost three plus billion dollars to sequence the human genome. And today we can do that for uh, on a small little bench top computer or, or machine for a couple hundred dollars. So these technology improvements that we have now are allowing us to do science in a much uh, greater way. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what HGSA has done to support research in 2020. And then I'll turn it over to Leora who will really do a deeper dive into some of the clinical trial advancements uh, in HD. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the research grants and, and advancements that we've made uh, through, through your generous support and the support of HDSA's other donors, um, through our research communications, through things like this webinar and Leora's weekly blog and our work in partnership with uh, uh, HD Buzz. Uh, we've done a lot of work and had success through our amazing Centers of Excellence program and HD Trial Finder over the, over the past year and have really provided a family, family voices and, and caregiver perspectives into the research through initiatives like HD Cope. In 2020, we supported uh, a lot of clinical research and awareness um, through our Centers of Excellence program, which I'll talk about in a second. But we also launched a, uh, a new pilot grant of research support um, where we provided research um, dollars to these four organizations you can see here, here Oregon, uh, Texas, Rush, and the University of Virginia. Uh, these are so basic research uh, and clinical research projects that are being funded and, and are available for families that uh, can participate at these different centers. We also maintained and continue to grow our robust hdtrialfinder.org database, um, which is a, you know, also has a call center component with it with trained navigators where families can uh, match to sites or studies that they may be eligible for and actually reach out and have a, you know, a contact name, a, a, an email, a phone number of somebody local that they can reach out to to uh, see if themselves or their loved one could participate. As I mentioned, our, in 2020, we saw our really our cornerstone program uh, is our Centers of Excellence program. And, and while what's really intended to provide as its name it, it says, is you know the center of excellence for care. We also want to ensure that our centers of excellence network has a, has their eye on the prize, and that is effective therapies uh, for Huntington's disease, disease modifying, hopefully um, uh, in the near future. So um, <clears throat> we've been kind of really focused on building and ensuring that infrastructure is in place and the expertise is in place to run not only provide lower the burden to families to get that expert care they need, but also to ensure that trials can be run quickly um, and uh, that the, these sites, trained expert sites will be available to provide or dose uh, patients with these novel therapies uh, that were going to require some uh, unique interventions such as lumbar punctures or brain surgeries, which we'll talk about. But we've grown uh, in, in February of last year, 2020, we announced that we grew to 50 centers of excellence in 33 different states, all the states shown here in blue. Uh, and hopefully many of you saw the press release that just went out, I believe it was last week, uh, where we announced the 2021 centers, um, where we are now at 54 different centers and eight partner sites. So a total of 62 different clinics in 35 different states. So this network is continuously growing uh, and hopefully providing that kind of increasing the, the access to expert care and research 
to families across the country. At HGSA in 2020, we continued with our core research programs uh, in funding the HGSA Human Biology Project. At HGSA, we have two real big things that kind of oversee or, or shepherd our, our, our thought process and what we fund scientifically. And that is we really wanna focus on the patient because humans are the only model of Huntington's disease. Mice, rabbits, rats, monkeys, they, they hear a lot of different uh, HD models, but they don't develop Huntington's disease. Humans do, and that's where we wanna focus our, our um, you know, precious research dollars on better understanding uh, the disease in people and helping to drive that science. So uh, since we've launched that program, the Human Biology Project in 2013, we've awarded greater than $5 million to um, over 30 different fellows across the world. We've also uh, continued with our Berman Topper HD Career Development Fellowship in 2020. This is uh, a unique uh, three-year program where we uh, support young PhD or MD scientists who really want to dedicate their careers to researching and caring for people with HD. And since we've launched that program in 2016, we're, we're approaching $2 million of, of donations or research dollars to those fellows. And one of my personal favorites is, is our smaller Yum, Don King Summer Research Fellowships, which despite the pandemic, despite the pandemic continued in 2020. And we funded uh, a number of young, bright researchers to work uh, in different HD labs across the country. These are, these are the five fellows. I won't go through all of them and all of the different research that they, they did, but I just wanted to highlight them that, that, like I said, despite the pandemic, this unique and, and very young and passionate group of scientists were out there uh, working in the labs over the summer and in the fall um, on these different projects. And, and we hope to one day have them come to a uh, convention soon to present their findings to the families. In 2020, as I mentioned, we, we also funded uh, our human biology project. Um, we, this, this is open to researchers across the world and you can see we've got a number of very exciting programs that we're funding and exciting to see this where these go uh, from researchers from America, Germany, Australia and Canada on, on projects really focused, uh, important projects that are, we, we believe will help us move the field forward and better understanding HD even you know early on in the case of uh, trying to identify some novel biomarkers, uh, neuroimaging biomarkers in, in pre-manifest Huntington's disease, looking in regions of the body that we think have been understudied. For example, in the Australian study with the Afat Glickman Johnson, looking at the gut microbiome. And are there things that we can learn from, from peripheral tissues like the gut um, that are also expressing this mutant Huntington protein that can help us um, you know, better understand the disease and maybe even develop some treatments that could um, combat some side effects. At HDSA, um, we've, we awarded a, a, a German Topper Fellowship in 2020 to Yazi Gola, Pal, Pal, Gola Malapur, who is a young scientist at uh, UMass uh, Medical School in Worcester. And, uh, She's doing really exciting science in the laboratories with Neil Ronan and Anastasia Korova, where they're literally doing what was science fiction stuff years ago, where we're, they're trying to develop therapies that could actually snip and shorten the CAG tracts in the Huntington protein. Now, these are years away from the clinic, but this, this is being done and, and supported by HDSA with hopes that it would advance into clinic in the, in the future. Some of the previous work through our human biology project uh, in previous years has come to fruition, which is really exciting. We've, uh, a few years ago, folks may remember that we've supported some work uh, looking at a particular process in the body called the uh, complement system, which is involved in the immune system. Um, and there's idea that this is uh, activated and overactive and pre-symptomatic in early stage HD patients. And if you could, in fact, um, if that's true, if you could kind of sequester some of the proteins or, or dampen that effect, uh, potentially with antibodies related to some of these immune system proteins, you could potentially um, uh, you know, modify the course of the disease or treat some of the symptoms. And, 
And HGSA funded some of this work, like I said, through the Human Biology Project, which led to an Exxon Biosciences launching a uh, clinical trial in 2020. Um, and it is actually recruiting in the United States as we speak. Uh, this is a study where they'll, it's going to be administering an antibody uh, against this uh, immune system protein called C1Q. And this antibody will bind to and kind of sequester this protein so it will have less effect in the human brain. So the drug, the antibody is administered through an IV infusion. And uh, you can see the some of the basic inclusionary criteria here. Um, so unique to this particular study is it is an open label study, meaning there is no placebo group. Everyone that's in this study will receive the active drug. And um, uh, the blue sites on the right uh, are all currently recruiting uh, patients. So if you're interested, certainly go to HD Trial Finder or, or check the, uh, the information below with the phone number for clinical trials at an Exxon Bio. So the Berman Topper Fellows, I just wanted to highlight this to, to kind of really show what a, while it's not necessarily making, they're making great scientific advances, but they're also uh, over time have, have really blossoming into this new uh, group of, of interactive uh, scientists and, and they're becoming, becoming really increasingly uniquely collaborative. And I just wanted to highlight them. Uh, this is a picture of, of all of them, uh, except for Yazi. Um, a month before the uh, pandemic started, when we actually could meet at conferences face to face on the left, and and here they are on the right in a Zoom meeting, which they now you know self aggregate every month and meet together um, to brainstorm about science and talk, have journal clubs and 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 collaborate and figure out what they what else they can be doing to advance science, which is really it gives me goosebumps seeing it, uh, uh, seeing pictures like this because it's it's showing that what we had set out to do to, with this unique fellowship program is working. And it's, it's being observed. I just want to share a quote from Ray Truant. Many of you may know him. Uh, Ray's a, a, a world-renowned Reishi researcher at McMaster University in Canada. And I just wanted to share this quote um, from him, which I really think kind of epitomizes what, what we've done here with, with these young group of scientists. And he says, you know, he's been watching the Berman Topper Fellows interact over the last couple of years. And he thinks that this has resulted in much more than a fellowship. What has become is a young PI or you know, a, a investigator think tank um, without gray beards to push them towards their historical agendas. And that is exactly what HD needs. And, and I couldn't agree more with Ray. So I just wanted to highlight this as, as a byproduct of some of the stuff that we're funding through HDSA. And finally, I just wanted to highlight uh, HD Cope. We've been really blessed in partnership. We've created this coalition a few years back, which is in partnership with the European Huntington's Association and the Huntington Society of Canada. So the three of us, the three organizations work together um, to create a coalition to provide patient and caregiver perspective to all of the different clinical trial sponsors um, uh, that you're gonna be hearing about from Leora. Uh, that are working in the HD spaces and make sure that they have these trials that are being designed are, are designed with the patient and the caregiver in mind. Are they in fact feasible? Are these endpoints that they're, they're seeking to, to do in their clinical trials, are they meaningful to families? Um, is this a symptom that if, if they could correct with their drug would, would have a big impact on their quality of life and on their families? And if not, then maybe they need to reevaluate um, their clinical trial design. So this has been uh, a really uh, wonderful year, despite the pandemic. Uh, we used to meet in person. You can see us uh, down the down in the bottom left with the HD Cope group meeting with Unicure before they launched their gene therapy study. And here they are on the, on the bottom right um, with the global group meeting with the Roche Genentech team in New York City um, shortly after the Generation HD1 trial had started. And uh, while we, we love and miss meeting in person, we've pivoted and have been more busy than ever uh, meeting virtually, virtually with all the different companies you're about to hear from. So um, that's a little bit about what we've done, uh, either in partnership with different organizations or through funding through HDSA in the past year. And now I want to turn it over to Leora, who's going to talk a little bit through what I think everyone's really most exciting to, excited to uh, hear about, and that's some of the clinical trial Oops. Sorry about that, Lior. Um, clinical trial advances that we've seen in the past year. 
Great, thanks very much. So uh, you've heard from George about HTSA's research initiatives and kind of the wider impact that we can have as a community by, by amplifying patient voices and supporting individuals who are really committed to HD research and human research in particular. Um, and now I'm gonna shift the focus a little bit towards uh, the HD research pipeline to talk about HD drug development and the clinical trials that are in progress and the exciting things that happened in 2020. So uh, what we mean by a pipeline is really everything that goes into developing a drug for HD, whether that's um, formulating a chemical to animal testing, um, all the way through the three different stages of a clinical trial. And this is really just a partial snapshot of the HD drug pipeline. Um, every one of these companies that's listed on the left here uh, is known to be working on treatments for HD, whether that is early development of a genetic drug focused on HD um, or a large clinical trial with, with hundreds of people that is focusing on a particular symptom. Um, and this is a super busy slide, as scientist slides often are, but really it's just to illustrate how much activity there was in 2020 and there is now around HD research. And this list is really growing all the time. So one of the most important studies in HD research right now is actually one that's not testing a drug at all. Um, and that's called Enroll HD. And HDSA will continue to promote and raise awareness around this study. It's an observational study. Um, there's no drug. Uh, there are sites worldwide and it's open to anybody in an HD family, regardless of genetic testing status, regardless of risk for HD. There are more than 20,000 participants right now helping to accelerate research by just visiting a study site once a year for just a few hours to participate in different kinds of tests with teams of HD experts. Um, and Enroll HD is important for a lot of different reasons. It is helping to monitor very early symptoms and signs of HD, which will be very important for the development of, of clinical trials in pre-symptomatic individuals. Um, Enroll also enables companies to efficiently select sites and quickly recruit participants from the, the pool that's involved with Enroll. Um, researchers can also study blood samples to develop drug targets. And um, it also means that there are more people meeting with HD expert doctors every year. Um, all of the data from Enroll is available to anybody with a legitimate question about HD research. Um, and, and part of the reason that there's so much activity in HD research is that this huge data set and our truly engaged community of families is really just a magnet for companies. So um, we encourage you to go to enroll-hd.org and check it out. Maybe we can type that link into the chat as well. So um, a nice example, I think, of the impact of a big observational trial like Enroll is that it can help identify new things about HD and design drugs to combat these things. So um, one really big question for researchers and families as well has always been, why do some people get HD symptoms so much earlier than others? Um, HD is caused by CAG repeats in the Huntington gene. These repeats are found in every cell of a person's body. And there's this observation that in general, higher numbers of CAG repeats leads to earlier symptoms. But there's a lot of variability. So it's possible that two people with the same number, so in this graph, uh, these, these people in this column here all have 42 CAG repeats. Um, and, but these folks became sick at the age of 40 and these became sick at the age of 70. So why does, why does that occur? And, and one thing that researchers have figured out by studying really thousands and thousands of blood samples is that um, in some people, in some parts of their bodies and brains, the CAG repeats continue to expand. So a blood test might show 42 CAG repeats, but um, in the liver or the brain in some of these cells, there might be much longer. Um, and this can actually cause symptoms to come on earlier. Now, within just a couple of years of that observation, researchers were able to identify some of the reasons why that was happening. 
Um, and companies like Locus 23 and Triplet have, have even um, begun to spring up. Um, and they've, they're starting to figure out some ways to slow down this expansion um, with the goal of, of ultimately delaying HD symptoms. So um, one company that's working on this is called Triplet Therapeutics. And in 2020, in spite of the pandemic, they were able to fully recruit an observational trial called Shield HD. And this trial is really focused on understanding more about CAG repeat expansion in people. They're, um, they're trying to understand what happens in the brain and the body and the blood um, as HD progresses by, by following participants closely um, for about two years. Um, and in parallel of this observational study, they're continuing to develop a therapy that could combat CAG repeat expansion. So that's, a, that's a, a, a really nice example of how observational studies like enroll lead to, to clinical candidates and, and new drugs. Um, I wanna talk a little bit now about um, genetic therapies that focus on the HD gene itself, also known as Huntington lowering. And um, I jumped right into, eight, into uh, like CAGs and stuff in the last couple of slides. So I'm gonna slow it down for a minute. Um, our genetic code is made up of many thousands of nucleotides that we represent with the, the letters A, C, T, and G. We have tens of thousands of genes and um, HD is caused by this one gene called Huntington. Um, everybody in the world has the Huntington gene and everybody has multiple repeats of the letters CAG in their Huntington gene. But HD happens when there are 40 or more CAG repeats. There is some variability there. So sometimes a person might have HD if they have 35 or 36 or more. But in general, what we know is that HD is caused by too many repeats in the Huntington gene of CAG. Um, the Huntington gene creates the Huntington protein. Um, we know that the Huntington protein is really important during the development of the brain for developing healthy neurons. Uh, it's got different functions in the brain and body as we grow. And um, when Huntington protein becomes expanded, because of those CAG repeats, it can form these protein clumps that kind of gum up the works and start to make neurons sick. Um, it starts to, to harm brain cells. And that, um, that's really what leads to the symptoms of HD. So the expanded Huntington protein is causing cells to get sick. And the whole concept behind Huntington lowering is to try and get rid of some of that harmful Huntington by making less of it. And here is, a list of companies that are working on Huntington lowering that are all working on getting at HD from its genetic source. There's a lot of science jargon here, but um, this slide is really just showing the sheer diversity of ways that different researchers and companies are tackling the genetic source of HD. So there's multiple approaches. There's all these companies here, different kinds of approaches and things that they're targeting different ways of getting the drug, delivering it to the, to the brain or body. And these are in different stages of development all the way up to human trials. Um, but we just really wanted to show you just how many, um, how many different entities are, are working on HD from a genetic perspective. Um, there are three companies that have Huntington lowering drugs in clinical trials now. Um, I am going to go into a little more detail about each of these, but this is kind of a summary of the progress that was made in 2020. Um, Roche Genentech, in spite of um, the pandemic, was able to fully recruit an 800-person trial that's going to last two years, and we have uh, expectations of results in 2022. WAVE is working on two safety trials and presented um, their initial results with full results expected this quarter. And they also announced a third trial. Both of those companies are working on drugs called ASOs that are delivered into the spinal column. And Unicure is uh, working on the first HD gene therapy. And in 2020, they were able to begin their, a very small safety trial. And uh, the first four participants underwent a brain surgery to deliver this therapy. And because um, they, uh, those patients did so, so well and um, had didn't have any danger to, to, to themselves, they, um, they were recently cleared to add another six people to this small trial. So um, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about these trials and some other upcoming ones. Um, 
But so uh, Roche Genentech has this phase three trial underway and it is called Generation HD1. And this is testing a drug that was originally called Ionis Huntington RX and then was next was called RG6042 and now it has a generic name, which is Tominersen. So Roche is testing this drug in a large phase three clinical trial with nearly 800 participants who um, mostly have early stage HD. Um, all of the sites worldwide of which there are more than 90 and more than 18 countries, uh, they finished recruiting in really in record time. Um, and each person in this study is gonna participate for two years. So Roche is expecting that the results of the study is gonna be announced sometime in, in 2022. Uh, people in the study for two years are going to are getting spinal injections uh, every two months. They either get uh, some people are getting a placebo, some are getting the ASO every two months, and some are alternating, and so they're getting the drug every four months. Um, and really, the goal of the study is to try and slow down the progression of HD. So part of what's being measured um, is participants' total functional capacity, and um, so if you are a family member sees a specialist, you might be familiar with this scale that measures a person's ability to work and manage finances and chores and take care of themselves in different ways. Um, and so really the goal of this study and a phase three study is, is the last step before, um, before drug approval, if it's effective. Um, the goal of this study is to see whether this drug can slow down the progression of HD. So we are, we have, uh, we're waiting with bated breath for, for 2022 when these results will come out. Now, Wave Life Sciences is conducting clinical trials of two different drugs to lower Huntington called uh, Precision HD1 and Precision HD2. And these are also ASOs delivered spinally. Um, but one of the main distinctions between the WAVE and Roche drugs is that Roche is focused on lowering all forms of Huntington, but um, the WAVE drugs are designed to lower harmful Huntington while, while attempting to keep healthy Huntington intact. Um, and in early 2020, WAVE communicated that their ASO uh, in the Precision HD2 trial was safe and well tolerated in people with HD. There were no dangerous side effects. They saw some promising Huntington lowering results, and they also announced that they'd added a new group of participants to both precision studies, and they're receiving a higher dose of the drug. So we are actually expecting the full results of this from these studies um, from WAVE this, this quarter, and they're also planning a third trial of a, a third ASO. Also in 2020, and also in spite of a pandemic, Unicure began in the US, uh, the first ever gene therapy trial for HD. Um, and whereas ASOs are delivered uh, regularly, gene therapy um, actually introduces genetic material into a person's cells and it requires a single treatment. Um, the drug is called AMT-130 and it is uh, packaged inside of a, a harmless virus and delivered one time via brain surgery. Certainly nobody wants to hear anything about viruses these days, but viruses called AAVs are actually very important in the field of gene therapy because as we know, viruses are very good at getting inside of our bodies and getting inside of our cells. So scientists can harness that and essentially use these viruses like envelopes to kind of send genetic drugs to the cells that need them. Um, this is going to be, this Unicurd trial is going, is, is going to be a very small trial um, with about 26 people all in the US. So far there have been four participants, two treated in June and two treated in October of 2020. And because there were no dangerous side effects after three to six months in these patients, Unicure was recently, actually just a few weeks ago, cleared to move forward with six additional surgeries. This, is, this trial is proceeding very slowly and carefully because it's really unprecedented, but so far it's all going smoothly and we're excited to see where it goes. Another very exciting development in the world of HD genetic therapies that really came to light in 2020 is um, the idea of a genetic drug that could be delivered orally. It would really be something if you could take a pill to lower Huntington protein, and it still sounds a little bit like science fiction, but um, in fact, 
oral Huntington lowering drugs are in development now. And uh, companies like Novartis and PTC Therapeutics are developing plans for clinical trials in people with HD. Novartis actually has an, an existing drug called Branaplam, and they announced their plans to begin a trial in late 2021. So this is actually a really amazing story. Um, Novartis originally developed Branaplam for a fatal childhood disease called spinal muscular atrophy but they discovered um, that it also lowered Huntington. So we already have some information about it being safe in people and even in children. It is taken by mouth, which would be incredibly convenient. Um, it is now being tested in, in uh, small studies of healthy adults. And we expect that trials in HD patients will begin late this year. Um, we don't have further information to share about locations or eligibility or really what this trial is going to look like, but the prospect of a, a Huntington lowering pill in the works, um, it's kind of the holy grail of um, Huntington lowering, so we're very excited to see this move forward. Um, so this is a, a trial that's kind of summarizing all of the Huntington lowering trials that are going on or that are expected soon. There are different methods of delivery spinal injections for Roche and Wave, a brain surgery for Unicure, potentially a pill for companies like PTC and, and Novartis. These are in different phases of trials. Phase one and two are kind of earlier safety and biology trials, whereas a phase three is an efficacy trial, really seeing if a drug um, is going to help with symptoms. There are different approaches here. So these ASOs are um, focusing on either total Huntington, so lowering all Huntington in the body versus um, WAVE is, is lowering, is attempting to lower mutant Huntington specifically and, and leave healthy Huntington intact. Um, Unicure and these uh, potential oral therapies are also lowering total Huntington. Um, and these Roche and WAVE trials have been fully recruited, but Unicure recruitment is ongoing. And um, we hope to see recruitment for oral Huntington lowering trials in the near future. Um, I spent a lot of time here on Huntington lowering, but it's certainly not the only approach to developing treatments for HD. There's lots of other clinical trials in progress that are aimed at helping with different symptoms and different aspects of HD biology. And all of these trials um, had milestones or began recruiting um, or had successes despite uh, the challenges of 2020. Neurocrine Biosciences is working on a drug for Korea. That's the, the Connect HD study that we'll be uh, having a webinar on next month. Perlenia, um, we had a, a, um, a webinar last month on the Proof HD trial. Um, and Nexon, George mentioned, is working on preserving synapses. And that work came out of some original work that was funded by HDSA. Sage Therapeutics had a small successful trial um, related, a safety trial related to a drug that um, is, is for cognitive changes in HD. Azvan is working on um, an aggression and irritability drug. And Triplet, we also mentioned, um, is an observational trial that is, and their company is working on shrinking CAG repeats. So there are lots of different approaches to um, to creating treatments for HD. And the best way to learn more about participating and about the trials that are going on in the US is to go to hdtrialfinder.org. And this is a service and a website that is managed by HDSA that also includes a, a call center and a website where you can enter in some of some very basic medical information for yourself or a loved one. And you can uh, see whether there are any trials happening near you that you might match to. You can also use the website without putting in any personal information, and you can um, you can you can learn more about the different trials that are happening. Um, you can you can match and get contact information for the for the sites of the trials. And we really try and keep this up to date with everything that we're aware of that's going on in the U.S. and parts of Canada as well. Um, there are more than, there are about 6,700 people signed up for HD Trial Finder, and that is growing all the time. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to George, and uh, he's going to ask you to help him review 2020. Yeah, thank you, Leora. Um, yeah, so, so from your, our progress, you've heard from myself and Leora, 
I want to, you know, this a little bit of interaction for everyone to make sure you're all awake um, is to help us do a little Yelp review on the year that was 2020. Um, and just to recap, let me just kind of go through kind of my top 10 list of, of what I think you've hopefully you've just heard um, and, and that we've seen not only one but two molecules that low, potentially lower Huntington are now in the clinic. Um, you've heard that uh, the very first gene therapy trial from Unicure um, has begun. That the largest ever phase three, the largest ever trial um, called Generation HD1 in HD uh, was fully recruited despite a pandemic. That initial results from WAVE's Precision HD study showed that the expanded or bad Huntington uh, can be selectively targeted. That's the first time that's ever been shown. Uh, a whole study, Shield HD from Triplet, was launched and fully recruited during the pandemic. Uh, companies like Azavan and Sage reported positive clinical data from their early stage studies. Two new phase three, these are the pivotal final, what we hope are final uh, clinical studies, uh, one for, called Connect HD and one called Proof HD have begun. And Exxon started a trial to target neuron function uh, in the United States. Uh, we have dozens of novel Huntington lowering drugs in the pipeline. And last but not least, um, which all of these trials have sites in the United States, which was certainly not the case years ago when, when companies were looking outside the US to run their initial um, exploratory clinical studies. So, um, you know, when we started off the, the webinar, we said, you know, I, my personally thought this year was, was like I said, politically and, and socially, and uh, it was awful. It was a zero star, one star year. Um, and I just showed it, you know, what, what does everybody say? What does everybody think? And certainly use the chat if you'd like. Um, would be interested to see, you know, what is it a one star year, despite what we've heard? Is it a two star, three star? Um, certainly feel free to share your comments with us now. I see four stars, four right. and a half, six. Six, all right. <laughs> the highest number. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I have to agree with that very first one. And I, of course, clicked the head and you probably saw it. Um, my <laughs> review was a four star. I screwed up, sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought this was a really great year. I'm not gonna give it a five star, obviously, until we have disease modifying drugs in hand and uh, accessible. Uh, for families across the world, that's that's a five-star year. Um, you know, when we can be out of a job, that's that's going to be a wonderful, wonderful year. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the, thank you for participating. I I, I want to just remind folks that um, you know a lot of this information is covered in our annual research update called the Marker, um, and we just released that. Uh, I guess that was in late December, but it can be found on hgsa.org as a PDF. You can download it, you can share it, email it to friends or family across the country or around the world. Um, but a lot of what Leora and I covered today is captured in the, uh, the marker. So certainly do take advantage of that if you're interested. And then just, you know, please continue to stay involved. This, there's so much going on that this is changing on a on a daily basis. It's hard for us to keep up. So I'm, I'm sure it's it's a little mind numbing for you all to try to keep up uh, with all of the work and the, the things that you have to do uh, that you're dealing with. So uh, let us do our work for you. Um, we'll keep you updated through things like this, the research webinars and through convention and, and Lior's weekly blog. And, and certainly do, if you're not already aware of HD Buzz, sign up and get uh, updates from that. So as late breaking news comes it becomes available, uh, the writers and staff at HD Buzz will certainly do their best to uh, kind of summarize that and put it in a, a lay language that you can understand. And then most importantly, there's so much work that remains to be done. Um, if, if you feel so motivated, whether yourself or your loved one and want to get involved, there is something for everybody to do, um, whether it's as simple as participating in Enroll, the observational study that Leora mentioned, um, logging into Trial Finder to see if you're available, you, you match to a particular trial that's in your area, or just to be seen or have your loved one be seen at a center of excellence. All of this will help drive science and care forward uh, 
through 2021 and the years to come. So with that, I wanna thank everyone. And um, please do, if you have any questions, type them in now. We'll do our best, Lior and I, to, to answer them. I did see, George, that one of the first questions we got was about, um, I think more about HDSA's research efforts. And someone was wondering whether um, our research efforts or um, research trials, et cetera, were affected by the pandemic, whether that's you know, fundraising or research progress. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It, honestly, everything. I can't think of anything that wasn't impacted uh, by, by the pandemic, um, certainly our ability to um, host events and, and um, whether it's fundraising events or educational events, uh, any kind of in-person things were, were impacted by, by COVID and continue to be. Um, but, um, and early on in the pandemic, I'd say in the, in the spring and summer, there, some of our research labs and we were aware that their, their labs were having to be forced to shut down for an extended period of time. But for the most part, um, from what I'm hearing, uh, that our partners and our HCSA funded partners, as well as the sponsors, um, running clinical trials, they're, they're back and running up and running, uh, for the most part. And, um, and, uh. So we're very confident that the things will start kicking up again uh, in, in maintaining our, our momentum in 2021. Um, let's see. There's a question about HD enroll and can it be done remotely by Zoom? Um, no, not yet. Um, but uh, there are certainly plans behind the scenes to make enroll HD um, easier and have a, a kind of virtual component. And I think they've discussed this. It's not ready to be launched quite yet, but a self-enroll where you'll be able to do some at home, either, whether with a smartphone or a computer, uh, using an app to kind of do self-assessments and uh, some more patient reported type of stuff uh, remotely without having to go into the doctor. So those types of things are coming, but not quite ready for prime time. Someone asked about the source of the genetic material in the Unicure uh, treatment. And that treatment, I believe, is a microRNA. And I believe that it's a, kind of a synthetic man-made string of, of nucleotides. That's my understanding, that gets packaged inside of this, this virus, this harmless virus that's able to get into cells. Um, you think there's, is, am I missing anything there, George? No, that's exactly right. It's just a, but a, a lot of these genetic treatments are kind of like, um, yeah, they're like man-made DNA RNA hybrids. So they're kind of um, these nucleotides are like built chemically, synthetically, and then they basically stick to the recipe that makes that harmful Huntington protein. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. And then recipes that that's a perfect analogy and that that this micro rna it's a big fancy word basically just it's it's this drug that's made by the virus is just producing this right over and over and that micro rna binds to the recipe that the mrna recipe that makes the bad huntington protein and when that happens um your body recognizes that as double stranded rna and it recruits a bunch of proteins and enzymes to that site and chops it up. So the, the bad protein or the Huntington protein won't be made. Um, and in that case, in the case of Huntington, uh, the Unicare, there's also a question about is all Huntington lowered? Um, and that answer is yes, it's, it's, not, it's a non-allele selective approach, meaning that uh, the, the Unicure gene therapy approach will cannot differentiate between the healthy, unexpanded Huntington and the mutant or expanded Huntington. Um, There's a question in here about um, if someone in late stage HD, for example, was able to lower their Huntington, would their sim symptoms lessen or would they simply stay, you know, basically the same? And that's a great question and we don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, you know, and this might be something where, so the, the short answer is we don't know, uh, but but there are some data and, and I know Lior used to work in a lab and now that granted this is the, a pivotal study that happened 20 years ago in mice where they 
you know, made mice really sick. Um, and they were able to use, have a genetic switch in these mice where when they were, you know, almost on the verge of dying, they're able to genetically turn off the Huntington faucet and those mice recovered, those very sick mice recovered. Those are mice um, and, and they're not humans. Um, we don't know if that will play out in people if we're able to lower their Huntington, um, but, but time will tell when we start dosing Huntington lowering agents into later stage patients. Someone asks whether there are any trials that those who were at risk for HD and have been tested negative can participate in somehow. So the majority of trials in the HD field are only going to involve folks who have, who are gene positive for HD. However, Enroll HD allows participation from anybody in an HD family, whether you're negative, there are spouses participating. Um, there are folks at risk who have chosen not to get tested. So um, I would say that right now that's the only trial I'm aware of that will take people who are negative for, for HD. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question just about the, kind of the timing of how long until, you know, once a trial is completed, how long until these treatments are generally av made available. And that, that really depends um, on a number of different variables related to their, F, you know, their submissions to the regulatory agents like agencies like the FDA. In the case of the COVID vaccines, you're seeing things getting, you know, emergency youth authorization very quickly. Um, you know, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which we're awaiting to hear authorization on the 26th of this month, um, that was submitted just a few weeks ago. Um, that's likely not. It'll take likely take much longer than that when, when uh, companies submit their package to regulators like the FDA for, for an HD drug. Um, but there are ways and things that they can get accelerated review and approval of these. But typically, um, it's really hard to it's hard to predict when these studies are done. For example, the, the Generation HD1 study, which we get a lot of questions about, you know, if this study ends and reports out in 2022, you know, does that mean it's going to be ready? at the end of 2022 uh, for, for families and patients? Um, the answer is probably is, I'd say no. Um, it'll take some time, but I can't put a real or distinct time frame on it. Someone asks whether there's movement towards ways to deliver these medications when they're approved, whether IV surgery or pill. So all of, uh, all of the trials that we talked about today we talked about Huntington lowering um, via spinal injection. We talked about brain surgery. Um, there are other trials that are not Huntington lowering based, but are focused on HD biology that involve IV. So it really depends a lot on the treatment. And I would also say that, you know, these companies are of course interested in being able to deliver drugs in a way that is, um, that is going to be able to reach the brain properly, but also, you know, they're interested in, in convenience and in um, being able to treat as many people as possible. So um, there are certainly, um, there are definitely, there's definitely research that's focused on improving methods of delivery um, on, uh, right, well, we're actually supporting um, a researcher, Nick Karen, who is doing some work on uh, something called nano discs. Um, so yes, this is definitely um, on on different researchers' minds. Certainly, we um, we we hope that uh, things will become more and more convenient. But because these uh, these gene therapies are really unprecedented, and they have to get to the parts of the the brain and spinal cord and body that are are very difficult to get um, to get there. Um, right now, a lot of them are are a bit more invasive. There's another question. Um, you know, can our neurologists suggest trials that would be a good match? Um, I thought about asking, but don't know if they can. What what I'd encourage you to do, maybe um, if they're in tune with a lot of what's going on and they're involved with the research community, they may know a lot of what we just discussed. Um, I find that most uh, kind of general practitioners or, or general neurologists may not know of all of the exciting things that are going on in the HD research community. Um, what I'd encourage you 
all to do is use trial finder as a resource to to enable those conversations so you know you can bring it up literally have it open on your smartphone or your ipad when you go into the office and you can force that conversation with your doctor and say listen from what i can tell it looks like myself or my loved one are a potential match for this study or that um, and force them to have that conversation to, and, and talk it through with you and if and if they can't answer that question certainly you can um, uh, reach out to Lior and I and, and the group here at HGSA. We're, we will be able to, to, you know, talk a little bit more about the specifics of different studies if you're, uh, if you wanted to know more details. I'll add to that that um, our centers of excellence, um, the vast majority of them, um, either. Uh, have actual participation in, in HD research trials, um, or they're required to be able to refer to research trials. So certainly a neurologist with an HD specialty um, within our network would have um, a good knowledge of, of the trials that are that are going on. Yeah. Well, the only other question I'm seeing, and it's not really a research related question, but it's just if, if HDSA sees any changes in, in our, or if we had any changes in our strategy and approach and communication in light of the fact that there's a new, what I'm assuming a new administration, a new, uh, uh, a new president and a new Senate um, uh, in charge in town. And, uh, you know, and scientifically, no, it hasn't really changed anything that will what we're doing um, from an advocacy, advocacy perspective. Many of you may be well aware that we have a bill uh, and have had a bill in Congress called the HD Parity Act for many years. Um, and uh, we are hoping to get that reintroduced uh, hopefully this month uh, into, con into the newest Congress, um, which has to be done before we can get that, um, you know, hopefully voted on and, and, and out of committee and, and signed into law. But we are more optimistic than we have been in a very long time, than even the fact um, that the, uh, there is a controlled, uh, the Democrats control the House, the Senate, and the presidency that we, we maybe will see some movement um, on that act. So uh, stay tuned and, and you'll be hearing more and a lot from us, from, from uh, our team here at HDSA, uh, looking for folks to get involved and uh, uh, hopefully get our, our leaders in Washington, D.C. to act on behalf of HD families for this important act. We have an interesting question here about whether there is a known benefit or purpose of the Huntington CAG before it expands and becomes mutant or problematic. So yeah, everybody has CAG repeats in the Huntington gene. Um, and they're probably quite important for maintaining the shape of that protein as it's doing its job. And interestingly, there's also some evidence to suggest that people with longer CAG repeats, um, either before they become symptomatic for Huntington's disease, or if they have kind of a longer but more normal range CAG, um, might have some advantages, uh, possibly uh, intellectually and physically. Um, but uh, beyond that, that's a, it's a really good question. There's still a lot of research into into what the CAG repeats actually do. Yeah, yeah, we know from work from Elena Catano in Milan, who's who's really intrigued by this phenomenon that um, not only do do does every human being have a Huntington gene, but um, most all animals have a Huntington gene or an analog that looks like the Huntington gene. And what we know is is as you go from humans down the phylogenetic tree, you know, down into to monkeys, down to rats, to mice, and into things like fruit flies, um, that CAG tract that's typically around 20 or so to 26 uh, in humans gets smaller and smaller as you uh, as the brains of these animals get smaller and smaller. So we think that has something to do with um, the development, uh, a brain development, uh, whether it's intelligence or as, as Leora was alluding to or things like that. I see a question about what trials are best for mid-stage yeah. HD. And I think this is a question that comes up a lot when we talk about these uh, genetic trials because a lot of them are recruiting folks with early symptoms. Um, but there are other types of local trials and other trials for symptoms that might be available to you if you want to check out hdtrialfinder.org is probably the best way to learn to learn more about that. Um, most uh, 
Most studies are involving people with early symptoms because it's the best and fastest way to measure changes. Um, it's very difficult to say whether a drug is working before somebody has gotten sick. And it's, it can also be difficult to see whether a drug is working when somebody is very sick. Um, and so, you know, we are very hopeful that even though these trials are involving a select population of people, that the medications themselves, if they're effective, would be available more widely. And finally, um, somebody, uh, I think some folks are, um, are posting some things about their, about their own symptoms. And while we are not um, medical doctors, um, we encourage you to check out the, the Center of Excellence Network to talk to your own doctor about symptoms that you're experiencing. And if you are looking for different kinds of uh, social and emotional support, um, we have also got some programs for, um, for talking with, with therapists or participating in uh, support groups. Um, and we can we encourage you to check that out on HDSA's website as well. Great. Yeah, so thanks, Leora. Um, and thank you everyone for, for joining us. I see it's a, a little after one o'clock, so I'm gonna be cognizant of time and, and just thank everyone for joining us. Um, and uh, if, if you certainly, if you have any questions, don't, don't be shy, reach out, but we, we are recording this and we'll, we'll make sure this is available uh, on hgsa.org within the coming days to week. And um, please, hopefully you'll join us next month for the uh, March 9th webinar on the Connect HD study. Um, so uh, until then, thank you. Thank you, Leora, and thank you everyone for joining us. And, and I hope everyone stays dry, stays warm, stays safe, and we talk to you uh, next month. Take care. Thank you. Bye.